Uh, hello, guys. Hello. Can we start again? Thank you. So it's um, okay. So very good. So I think we are uh, ready. Some students are still missing, but I think we can start. And um, uh, with the uh, okay, so Tanya, uh, maybe you can share the screen and we can start uh, with the lecture. Okay. So um, we can start. Everything is okay now. Yes. Yes. Please go ahead. Can we start recording? Okay. Okay. So um, I wanted to summarize um, briefly what um, what we did so far and where we are going. So, we have discussed um, maximal informative coding and we have discussed information transmission by multiple neurons uh, in the presence of noise and we observed that there are a series of um, phase transitions. So, there are different noise models and um, different applications, but um, as you decrease noise or increase the number of underlying um, discrete elements over which you are averaging, then the number of states um, follows a branching process and uh, um, increases exponentially really with um, this number of n. I didn't derive this. So we will talk about it, but since the title of the course is Information um, Maximally Informative Coding and Hyperbolic Geometry, I wanted to point out the link that we will be following up on, and um, also in uh, Matthias, we will discuss a little bit of Matthias' papers too, um, later on in the course, but um, basically the number of states that um, as you decrease noise, um, follows a branching process, and uh, this is um, increases uh, exponentially with um, um, decreasing noise or um, decrease increasing number of um, uh, steps. So, as uh, was mentioned briefly in the course, this branching process is. Um, has a connection with hyperbolic geometry. But so far we have discussed um, 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 only one-dimensional variable. So the plan for um, today and the next few lectures is to talk about maximally informative coding when the signal is multidimensional. And then the concluding set of lectures will um, bring things together. This hierarchical branching process for multiple, um, when you allocate multiple cell types to encode one input dimension, plus the uh, analysis that we will start today about how to code multiple variables at the same time. 
So the plan for today is we will start with maximal informative coding of multidimensional inputs and then discuss two related famous solutions that one should be familiar with. One is, no, uh, is known in engineering as a water filling solution and I will uh, describe the origin of that name or um, a related phenomenon, decorrelation. And uh, we will do comparison with neuronal filtering in the retina and in uh, the visual <coughs> cortex. <coughs> so, <coughs> as a reminder, we considered information transmission for a linear Gaussian channel. And now, um, after this reminder, we will go towards multidimensional Gaussian input. So the, what we discussed so far is that for a given signal x, the detector generates data y that are really linearly related to the signal with some corrupted noise xi. And then we discussed that if um, uh, we have a Gaussian distribution, then it has in general this form. It's an exponential of a quadratic function where z minus its average, the mean, divided by the variance times the prefactor. And then the entropy of this distribution is minus um, um, p log p, ignoring some infinite uh, additions to this equation, or the average of log of p of z, or this will be um, just the variance of the signal. And the mutual information is um, this formula here. Uh, depends on both p of x and p of y. And uh, for a linear Gaussian channel, there is um, an important result that this is a one half of the log base 2 of the variance of the output divided by the variance of the noise. Or you can write it explicitly because the output has noise in it as 1 plus the variance of the input signal times the gain divided by the variance um, of the noise added. So sometimes it's also written as, uh, and we will also use this as the variance in the signal divided by what is it called effective um, variance. Um, so the noise is added to the in um, after the input, but in a linear system you can think of that you add, added this noise um, to the input, so the effective input noise. So in other words, the information for a one-dimensional variable is a <coughs> log base 2 of 1 plus the variance in the input signal divided by the effective variance in the noise or in this equation, variance in the output divided by the variance in the output. So this is in the 1D case, and now um, we will talk about multiple variables. So imagine that we have um, multiple output variables and multiple input variables, and we would like to know what is the best way of filtering them to um, um, to maximize information. So in the linear case, uh, we have just like we had for one dimensional case, but now in, in the multi-dimensional case, yi is, um, is a vector and its components are given as linear combinations of the input variables x, j, and this is the matrix j, um, j, j plus xi, and we would like to know what should be this optimal matrix or how to filter signals optimally. So the analog of, um, um, remember the equation that we had? Maybe, Matteo, would you mind writing the equation for um, this um, linear Gaussian channel one-dimensional case? Um, on the board, and then we will um, plus x squared 
over is eta effective square light. So this is one way of writing it. So the other way is log 2 of, say, the fluctuations in the output, right, divided by the noise squared, right? Is it OK? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. All right. So now <laughs> you see that from the expression that we will have with multiple vari variables will be similar to this. But instead of um, the, well, maybe people can guess where we're going. But instead of. Uh, um, variance of uh, the noise and variance. So we have the variance for the signal, for example. So the multidimensional analog is uh, instead of just variance along one component, we will look at variance along multiple components. So we have a covariance matrix, SISJ of XI and XJ. So then, uh, same thing for the noise. So, uh, in principle, one could guess um, um, the, the form of um, that, that um, we will obtain. But the relevant probability distribution, if, um, if because it's Gaussian, instead of in the multidimensional case, we have what we had before, a quadratic function. But now, instead of dividing by the variance, we multiply by the inverse of the covariance matrix and uh, sum across the components. And instead of multiplying, uh, dividing in the prefactor by the variance, we divide by the determinant of the covariance matrix. So <clears throat> this is a repeat. And uh, now. Uh, this is the expression for the information as we had before, and we can look at what are the variables, what are the functions that we will need. So instead of x and y, we have a set of x and a set of y. We are computing mutual information between them. So we will need uh, the joint probability distribution between them, which may be difficult to write down. So instead, we will write it as a product. Um, we will need a conditional distribution. We have yi given x j, and um, we have uh, responses. Is it? Um, would you like to write it down? Yeah. So this is the average over the log base two of p of xi given the yi uh, divided by p of xi, right? So, something like this? Yes. Yes. Yes, we can do that. It's average over all the xi, over the joint distribution of the xi and the yi. Okay. Okay. Hmm. So the um, you see that uh, Matteo wrote there in the denominator p of x i. So we need this. Prob so that's how it looks like. That's what we will have. And um, this is a scary looking of y i given x i. Is actually has a very simple form. <laughs> Um, it's complicated in, in terms of uh, the number of um, expressions, but remember how in the one-dimensional case, to write down conditional distribution of y given x, we just write it in the equivalent form of the Gaussian probability distribution for the noise. So this is the noise. This is the noise covariance matrix, and this is the noise component j. So mm -hmm. you, you will find this expression in the Bialix textbook and then um, in other places, but 
um, this part of the lecture follows his textbook. And then here in the, um, in the denominator, we will have a determinant of the noise covariance matrix. So any questions so far? So these are the two probability distributions that we need. And, um, and also we will need um, P of YI. Um, but, but even though it is scary, so Anthony Z in his book on uh, uh, um, general theory in a nutshell says dying, um, drowning in a sea of indices. So, you know, there are a lot of indices here, but let's, you know, as long as uh, conceptually you think about what is written here, so this is the noise. This is another noise component, and this is the covariance matrix. Then we don't, we will have some guidance and not and follow all of these indices. So then we need this um, P of Y, but um, we know it's going to be Gaussian. So um, so this should be uh, Y's here, and this is determinant of um, covariance matrix of the noise. So instead of deriving, so one way of um, deriving this distribution is to take P of Y given Xi, multiply it by Xi and integrate. But because we know it's going to have this form, we will just need to compute the covariance matrix of output variables. So S of Y is, uh, is G times the covariance matrix of the signal times G transpose plus the covariance matrix of the noise. And uh, using this, then we have the expression for the P of Y. Maybe it is, um, it, is it um, uh, useful to derive this uh, covariance um, matrix of the output signal? Uh, is, every, is it um, clear or? So, so, you have, uh, so why, if we go back here, so we know that y i is uh, equal to g i j x j plus psi i, and uh, so this is the, the covariance of the output, right? Yes, the covariance, and then the covariance of the output, and then uh, uh. This is uh, essentially um, yi is uh, somewhere, uh, say, L of uh, uh, g i l times x l plus this psi i, right? And then uh, this is sum over L prime of G, J, X, G, J, L prime of X, L prime plus Psi J, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Then, uh, 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 well, these are all zero mean, okay? So then uh, if you take uh, this times this, uh, you see that uh, you have uh, uh, sum over L and L prime of G I L average of X L X L prime G uh, J L prime. Okay. If you take these times uh, these, uh, these are independent, uh, and so the expected value is zero. Okay, if you take this times this, uh, these are Xi i and Xl are, Xl prime are independent, so the expected value is zero. And if you take this times this, uh, you get the uh, uh, average of Xi i, Xi j. So you see this is uh, in uh, matrix form, uh, this is just the matrix G, which uh, is written there. 
Then uh, you have the matrix uh, of the input, uh, which is S. And this is G transpose, because you see the two indices are transposed. G transpose. And this is uh, the covariance matrix uh, of the noise, uh, which is this uh, matrix here. OK? Very simple linear algebra. Huh? I, I, I cannot see. Cannot yes. Yes. OK. OK. Are there, are there any questions from the audience? I can't quite see the chat. Oh, I think it's OK, no? It's, uh... OK. OK. So <clears throat> um, it's a little bit cut off, but now we have this um, average, but it's a logarithm of one probability distribution, which we have here on the previous slide, and P of YI, which is the same Gaussian, but with the variance that is written on the board SY. So what to do about this? So the logarithm, because of the exponential part, is this um, um, term right here. And P of Y, um, I, the exponent of this becomes plus, and this is Y, S, Y to the minus one, and I can um, write here. So this will be Transpose. Okay, and then there are also prefactors from from here. So, in other words, the um, the average of this is um, when we take the average. Over probability distribution. Um, the average of these y's, for example, gives you a covariance matrix. And this is a covariance matrix of the noise. So these two terms cancel out, and it's actually similar to what we had in, um, in the one-dimensional case. Plus, we have one-half of the logarithm of the ratio of the prefactors, determinant of Sy over determinant of um, covariance matrix of the noise. So in other words, all of these complicated integrals, they mostly disappear. And the only thing that is left is the logarithm of the determinant of um, the covariance matrix of the output divided by the covariance matrix of the noise. All the determinants of of these, uh, right? Uh, okay, so yes, we are doing the other calculation. Right? And then uh, y i. Okay, so here you have the determinant of s y, and then. Uh, the normalization of this distribution here as the determinant of the noise. Okay. So the ratio of two determinants is the determinant uh, of the ratio. Okay. So this is one half log yes. two um, of the determinant. It, it's a little bit difficult the... to hear. So oh. I think it's okay for me. But, yes. Uh, Can you hear better? No? Yes, now better. So I'm just saying that the, the determinant, the ratio of the determinants is the determinant of the ratio. And then uh, the log of the determinant uh, is the trace of the log. Right? 
this is what uh, you are uh, using there. So this is one half times the trace of uh, uh, the log, log two of uh, Sy times this Xi to the minus one. Okay? So, th so that the log of the determinant is the trace of the log uh, is clear to anyone. So the way to think about this is that the determinant is the product of the eigenvalues. The log of the determinant is the sum of the eigenvalues, which is exactly equal to the trace of the log of the matrix, which is the log of, of this this matrix here, okay? Okay. Okay. So now we can compare these um, expressions and relate them to, for example, one-dimensional case. So in one-dimensional case, we had information being one-half log two, one plus um, g times um, power of x, uh, you know, power of y divided by the noise, or a signal divided by the effective noise. And what we have here is the sum over independent components. So in the Gaussian case, yeah, I'm wait. I'm just rewriting your equation. Essentially, you are comparing this equation here to this equation here, right? Or uh, even better to log two of one plus g squared x squared divided by. Uh, this square. Right? Is it okay, Tanya? Yes, I think so. Yeah. Um, so, why is the Gaussian case interesting? Because the Gaussian case, we can uh, diagonalize it and transform it to a basis where um, the components. The system is acting along independent components. And so in this case, we know that information from independent measurements ends. And so we, we can say, well, it was along one variable, and now it just a sum across multiple variables. But the technical expression is that we have to work with the product of the two matrices. But if we can diagonalize this matrix in um, the same basis, then it will be a sum of the information uh, along the different channels. So um, one of the useful examples, so this is just a, a rewrite, and um, is in terms of uh, filtering and Fourier uh, transform. So there are multiple ways of um, um, multiple applications of this equation. One, so the equation that we would like to study is um, the coding of multiple variables. And it could mean that multiple variables are variables in time. For example, I still have a one-dimensional signal, but the values at different moments in time I consider as different components. And so then the neural response is also yi as a function of time, so it is um, same analog signal, but across different times. So in that case, what we will do is uh, 
create predictions for how to filter signals optimally in order to transmit most of the information. But a parallel analysis where this has also been applied, and we will also compare this with data, is that Xi represent, for example, different spatial signals. You can think about um, in the visual scene, different pixels will be different Xi components. And then how should I filter these Xi components in order to uh, maximize information? And the Yi could be um, even one dimensional, it can be one neuron, and we are considering what is the optimal filtering in space to maximize information per neuron, or it could be multiple neurons, and so then it will be information maximization across the array. Um, any questions so far? Okay. Okay. So, uh, in the case of the optimal filtering, which we'll do first, instead of the summation across um, these indices i, we can think of this as an integration in time. So, I have a signal x of t, and I'm convolving this signal x of t by multiplying by a kernel g of tau at times that, pre, uh, at, um, that weighs signals at previous times. And as a result, I'm getting the response of the neuron at time t. So I'm asking what is the optimal filter g of tau to which I should apply, um, which I should apply to the signal in order to get the optimal um, maximal informative signal. So the question is, I, I, the signal is corrupted by noise. And at some frequencies, the signal is more, contains more noise than the signal. So intuitively, it might be useful for me to eliminate those frequencies where the signal is overwhelmed by the noise. So I will be throwing away some signal. That's the purpose of the filtering. But I will be throwing out more noise than signal if um, I take into account the spectrum of the signal and the noise. So that's the basis for, that's the goal of this derivation. So we are rewriting this again. One can rewrite it in terms of the effective noise with the covariance um, matrix. And uh, the interesting part and the advantages of the Fourier transform is that we are thinking about stationary signals. And so the correlation function, both for the noise and for the um, signal, has to depend only on the time difference between the two variables. Um, I, if I have a time series, I average x of t and x of t prime, but it doesn't depend on all values t and t prime, so it's not a full um, matrix. Um, that is, it's a full matrix, but it depends only in, um, I want to say it's a circular matrix, but, but what's the term? Um, it's the autocorrelation. No, I mean, what are these matrices called where... Um, the Diagonal matrix. Uh, you think it's there? I thought it was um, kind of um, oh, the only, yeah. um, and, and with periodic conditions. A anyhow, so it depends on the t minus t prime. And uh, same thing for the noise. And in that case, these matrices are diagonalized uh, in the Fourier domain. So when we go to the Fourier domain, um, instead of uh, uh, thinking about the 
autocorrelation matrix as a function of time, we think about it as the power spectrum as a function of frequency. And different frequencies are independent if this is a linear system and the signal is Gaussian. And so uh, once we have this, then we say information is obtained by adding contributions across frequencies. And in that case, both the covariance matrix for the noise and for the signal are diagonalized in the same basis and so in the same Fourier basis and so our equation for the um, for the time series between um, for the information between a sequence of inputs and the sequence of outputs is one half sum over these frequencies of log two one plus the signal to noise ratio. So our goal is to find how to filter G of omega in a way to maximize this expression. Any questions so far? Uh, Carlos, signal to noise ratio. The question is what is SNR? It's essentially uh, uh, so this uh, this thing. This is the signal, signal, and this is the noise. And this is the signal to noise ratio. Yeah. The issue is that uh, if uh, in this case. Uh, if the signal and the noise are diagonal in the same basis, then essentially you can take also G to be diagonal on the same basis and you can just uh, have these to be uh, just a sum over the eigenvalues, which are the uh, eigenvector, which are the Fourier modes of, uh, of, um, of this thing. So um, that's our expression, signal to noise ratio. One could define it as the power spectrum of uh, the signal over the power spectrum of refractive noise. And uh, um, this uh, sum over frequency, you can uh, also write this as the integral over frequencies times time. And so then uh, people define information rate which is just this integral across frequencies. And our goal will be to maximize this uh, integral. So um, now we can talk about two specific solutions which are uh, famous. So the first one is the water filling solution, uh, first the discovered, uh, obtained in engineering. So, so far, um, None of this, you know, this expression between for the mutual information between signal and uh, the output is, um, of course, um, it's a linear system, so it is not only, it's not neuroscience specific um, and was obtained in uh, engineering. But we will discuss application of this to neuroscience. So we are interested in maximizing information rate but it's important to keep in mind that I'm maximizing information rate, but at a given constraint. For example, the variance of the output signal. Because it's not fair to say, um, if, if I could have a, a filter that has uh, very large values, so I will be able to multiply signal by arbitrary large values, then in effect, I will scale down the noise. So, but we know that's not realistic, that's not, um, um, that does not re reflect the case that the noise is, um, um, cannot be removed without um, investment in metabolic constraints. So we maximize information rate for a given variance of the output. So this is our rate, it's the integral over, I would say, d omega. And um, 
subject to constraint that the integral of the um, signal at the output is, um, is a constant. So we add a Lagrange multiplier um, to this integral. And so when we optimize, so we divide and you get 1 over log 2, 1 half is from here. And then um, it is one logarithm is the sum of the signal plus effective noise. And um, that's something that, so only S of omega depend on the filter G and uh, minus lambda. So now this has to equal to zero for an optimal solution. Or in other words, we get that this, the sum of the signal um, after filtering plus noise should be some constant. So that's the idea uh, behind the water filling solution. You think of noise as um, a shape of um, um, some kind of a vase that is holding water. And then the signal is um, I'm putting into this uh, vase and the sum of the signal plus noise has to be equal to a constant. So this is an example analysis for um, neural, um, neural data. So we had, <clears throat> this is uh, the estimated noise for photoreceptors and uh, the estimated noise for uh, large monopolar cells. And this is how the amount of um, filter, so this uh, the shaded area, is how one should filter, uh, how photoreceptors should filter the incoming signal, and, and so on. So in other words, with this water filling solution, you measure the reliability of the, your, um, of the channel at different frequencies. And um, if this is the output of the signal that I can transform, then above this level, I should filter, I should, my filter should be set to zero. Um, is that, so any questions so far for the water filling solution? So the optimal filter will go to zero at these frequencies. Okay, so in this region, uh, the uh, S omega should be the difference between the water level and the depth. I mean, so this is uh, NF. And outside of this region, it should be zero. Okay. So a related... Um uh, a, a related formulation it has a different name, decorrelation, but in, in effect it, it's uh, pretty much the same, but it talks about uh, the gain G. What is the gain G that will give you this water filling solution? So uh, one solution was to say it's S, uh, the output variance, um, signal variance divided by the effective noise, or uh, you can say it's uh, signal variance, and now we explicitly write the gain divided by neuronal noise. And we go through the same ex um, exercise as before. We have signal, we have the gain, and we have noise added, so or signal over effective noise. And this our water filtering solution is that signal times the gain has to be a constant minus the noise, or the gain has to be constant minus the noise over um, the power spectrum of um, input signals. 
So this is interesting. It tells you that if uh, some signals are common, then the filter should uh, have lower sensitivity to um, those signal components. So, in, for example, in natural scenes, as we will discuss, the signals are changing relatively slowly. M mostly, the null hypothesis is that nothing is changing. But you know from experience and perception is that we are very sensitive to sudden motion, sudden changes in um, light intensity and um, um, edges and so on. So we are sensitive to these signals because they are rare. So most of the signal is dominated by low frequencies, but the... Um, gain is set such to suppress the dominant frequencies. Now we can um, look at it in a quantitative way comparison with the data. Any questions about this decorrelation solution? So this one, um, a little bit of a side, as I mentioned that most of the things in natural world are um, very, uh, change very slowly. So if one pixel is white, like on this screen, then the nearby pixel will also be white. Same thing here, but we are sensitive to edges because they are, um, relatively rare, even though, you know, to us, this is the most salient thing. And um, in order to um, make predictions, we need to know the, sig uh, the signal power spectrum. Therefore, people have studied um, extensively the statistics of signals in the natural world. And this um, involves uh, statistics of video signals, um, natural images, so that was important for the development of television, and statistics of natural sounds for telephone communication and radio. But also we will talk about later um, for olfactory signals. And it turns out that in all those cases, the common observation is that the signal has this power law um, power spectrum. So what is shown here on this graph is um, the power spectrum as a function of spatial frequency. This is from Bill Bellick's um, paper on the scaling in the woods in the parallel ladder, but you will find this um, po um, power law behavior also in uh, natural sound and uh, in turbulence, um, because of the turbulence also in the olfactory signals. Any questions so far? So then I will have a little question about this graph. You see there are two graphs, and uh, they, they are overlapping, but you can tell that they are slightly different. Can anybody guess what is the origin of these two, um, two lines, and what sets the limits between, um, for natural images that we can, over which we can measure um, the power spectrum? Come on, it's Fourier analysis. What does the largest uh, um, frequency correspond to? Or the smallest frequency correspond to? This for an image, no? Tanya. 
Uh, I think uh, I can't quite hear the answer, but uh, um, could you repeat the answer? No, the, uh, I mean, uh, my question was, uh, what does the um, largest frequency correspond to? So I think basically... But it was not uh, a question to you. The length of the camera with which these um, images were taken. Yeah, yeah, it was a question to the, to the students. <laughs> So, you, you know, how big of an image I can take and how well, uh, how small I can discretize. So that's the largest frequency. Mm -hmm. uh, the largest frequency and the smallest frequency in terms of how large is the image in terms of the smallest pixel that can be resolved. So in this case, it was uh, with two different cameras and uh, one could see that they overlap um, despite being taken with do, two different focal lengths, but you can merge them together to have a joint power law distribution. So uh, this is an example of, uh, so we know that natural signals have this one over F power uh, signal. And so, uh, uh, Atik and Redlich used this, and you, they said, so if you go back to our equation, which is constant minus noise divided by the signal, <coughs> so one component is one over square root of signal uh, power, and so this is one over F squared, so the square root is one over F, and so when we invert this, you will get some kind of a filter that is a bandpass filter. So that was the first prediction that neurons in the retina should um, integrate within one region and then subtract from a broader region. So that was one of the first explanations for the center surround structure of receptive fields in the retina. Where, and um, the intuition behind this observation is that it should, um, it would be redundant for the neuron, if each neuron uh, re um, relate the values of um, pixels individually. Instead, it relates how that pixel is different from the surrounding pixels. And so this is a theoretical prediction in uh, layout, um, spatial layout. But one can also do it in um, the Fourier domain, as we were discussing. So this is actually Attic. I'm sorry, this is wrong reference here. But, um, um, and uh, so this is um, the um, noise. Curve B is the noise. And uh, the product of our equation, which was constant minus the noise over uh, the signal and uh, results in this joint kernel A, and that's uh, the predicted uh, filter. And they actually went further than that um, and asked how does the solution change when we change noise? So. Can anybody guess what happens when, uh, how can we change the amount of noise in the visual system? So our equation is, um, I will write it here. Maybe, Matteo, if you could also write it too. So it is um, constant minus noise over signal and then square root of A. Yes. So. Oh my God.
So, the prediction should be if um, noise is smaller, then I can decorrelate more. So, if noise is zero and the signal is um, If noise is zero, then the optimal filter is one over square root of S of omega. So if the signal is one over F squared, then um, one over F squared will be, the optimal filter will be F. So this is in this limit of zero noise. If um, noise starts to dominate, then um, then it um, shuts off, and then it has to go down to, to zero or to a constant. So this is in the case of the retina. One way to change the noise is um, to reduce the magnitude of the signal, and so to make con. Uh, um, reduce the overall brightness. So present a stimuli that have lower contrast. And then what happens is that when the signal to noise is high, there is a strong decorrelation and um, neurons report average over uh, subtract the surround. But then when the signal to noise decreases, they uh, remove this um, filtering, and then they can um, start to integrate, and they become more integrating. So in that case, if you have a lot of noise, then we are trying to pick up the signal, so you start to average and average over broader areas. So that's a theoretical prediction. And now we will, um, I'll show you comparison with, um, um, with data. So this is for human psychophysics, and um, um, this is the predicted filtering uh, at different signal-to-noise ratios, and these are the measurements. So this model, I think, has only one adjustable parameter and is able to account for a, um, uh, changes in the filtering across a wide range of um, light intensities. Now I will skip a little bit over slides. Uh, they were a little bit out of order, so uh, I want to show you some uh, a slide that um, This one. So this is a famous curve, and it um, relates to this. Is, if you recall, so the graphs were had this a uh, filtering shape, and you can verify this using this uh, simple construction, and it is a test of your own visual system. So does everybody see this curve right here? Like goes up and then down. Yes, okay. I see. Um, I can't quite hear back, but... All right. Yes, people so see it. What, um, what is shown here is are the sinusoids. And the, it's a modulated sinusoid, and the frequency is increasing from low frequencies to high frequencies. And the contrast is steadily in, um, decreases from this part of the curve to this part. So there is nothing, um, there are no changes in... Uh, um, so the reason we see this curve, 
So the, the change in the contrast is the same along the y-axis. But because we are more sensitive to this range of um, frequencies, you continue to see the modulation up to a smaller change in, um, uh, in contrast. But at lower uh, frequencies and at higher frequencies, the signal should become grayer at a smaller resolution in X. Is that okay? So you see how this picture goes together with um, the, um, the measurements of um, the, the curves that mm -hmm. I showed from Attic and Renlick's paper. So um, then Um, another part, so then there are two other things that we can discuss. And um, another example is um, in the retina, you can ask, so this was for information maximization, but another part is um, one can separate this for uh, general um, ask how well we can reconstruct the signal not only for to, just in general to maximize information but more specifically to reconstruct the actual signal and uh, here's another example of comparison of the filtering that is done between the photoreceptors so in this case y of t again represents the filtered version of the input signal plus noise and in the Fourier domain, that's our equation where the output is g of omega times x of omega. And what filter to apply to the outputs y in order to best estimate the input signal. So in this case, we estimate the signal x, we have applied to the outputs y with a kernel f. And we seek to minimize the average reconstruction error. So in that case, the reconstruction error is the actual signal minus the estimated signal. And um, we average over different noise generalization over time. And um, then in this case, so this is in reconstruction error between x of t and its reconstruction and the integral over dt. So actually there are two integrals here. So then we use a property of the Fourier transform that the power in um, real space, in real time, is the same as the integral over frequencies in the Fourier space. And so if I have a convolution between two signals, then uh, we take when we take in the Fourier domain, that's the product of two frequencies. So in that case, the reconstruction error is <clears throat> x of omega minus um, this convolution becomes um, output y times f of omega. And so in this linear case, so if the frequencies are independent, then we can um, find the optimal f, um, fill how to filter outputs to reconstruct the signal. And so we minimize um, the reconstruction error with respect to the unknown function f. And so what you get is uh, the average between x of omega minus f of omega y of omega times the derivative so um, in this case, we divide it by f complex conjugate of omega. So we get y of omega. And then the average still holds. And the average should be 0. So rewriting this, you get that f of omega is equal to the um, power between x and y 
divided by the output of y. So it's a similar equation to decorrelation because um, um, I'm dividing x by the uh, filter, how the signals were filtering y. Hmm. So now, in our case, y of omega, the signal y, is related to x of omega with g. And so um, one can rewrite this top part, y um, complex conjugate of omega times x, um, as, um, um, so when we average, the noise disappears. And so it's uh, G complex conjugate of omega times the power of the signal. And then the output of Y is um, what we already had in the past. It's the gain squared times the, ga um, the input power plus noise. And so the optimal filter is given by the ratio of this signal here, which is g um, star times s over the output power, which is g squared over um, the, the gain factor times s plus noise. So that's the same um, similar decorrelation solution. And so when noise is um, small, then you get that the optimal way to filter uh, the outputs in order to get the inputs is to do the decorrelation. So um, it should be one over the gain that was applied to the signal. So one more time, so if a signal X has a gain G, in order to reconstruct it, we just divide it by G of omega. So the optimal filter is to invert this, um, um, the, uh, the filtering that was applied. So, and then taking into account noise, um, we get that this is the optimal filter for signal reconstruction. And then um, we can multiply both the numerator and denominator by G. So you will get the, uh, the power here in the G omega squared. And this is one over G is this um, piece that without the noise plus the ratio of the output power spectrum to the output power spectrum plus the noise. And so it is one over G, which would had if the signal to noise ratio was infinite plus signal to noise ratio over, so if we divide by the noise here, then you get signal to noise ratio of omega divided by one plus signal to noise ratio over omega. So in the high noise regime, this is the optimal filter piece. And uh, it has some components that is, depends on the signal and some component that is the only property of the filter um, in the retina and the noise. So this is stimulus specific and this is the neural, neural part. Um, how was the gain applied? and its noise level. So, um, and this part is stimulus independent. And now here is another comparison um, from Bill Bellick's paper. So we can compare uh, this part of the filter. So the argument is that um, we have rods, which is the first stage of the system. They have some gain G of omega that they will apply in order to maximize information, but they also have noise. And so if the next stage wants to invert this optimal nonlinear, um, optimal filter, uh, take into account noise, then one can see that the filtering the, um, that, that, that is done by the bipolar cell actually corresponds to this prediction. Um, taking into account the filtering of the rod cells and the noise and its noise, you get the response of the bipolar cell. So to summarize this part of um, 
the derivation, it says that in order to maximize information, I have to filter signal in a certain way. But then to actually use it, I might need to invert this filtering. And when I do this, I have to take into account noise. Um, and um, at the first synapse in the retina, one can see the evidence that the filtering is exactly what you would expect if you wanted to maximize information, but then reconstruct back the original signals. Any questions? Okay. So, um, one can also apply this uh, um, to the spike train domains. So, how um, you know the input that was put into the system and the spike trains that were obtained. And so one can use this equation in order to estimate the underlying signal values. And that would be um, predictions. And then another part that I would like to um, bring back is that the actual signals are not always um, um, are not only correlated, but they're also non-Gaussian. So, and that affects the next level of uh, predictions. Let me see. Okay. So, in signals in natural world are not only correlated but the amplitude is non-Gaussian. So, so far we talked about predictions for Gaussian signals, but we can also talk about how predictions are modified uh, for non-Gaussian signals. So it turns out that these are harder to make, but you can um, uh, make some approximations for the input signals that uh, will make it Gaussian. And um, so one of this is that if you look at the probability distribution of light intensities as a function of uh, the deviations from the mean, so this is for the auditory signal, for a Gaussian, you would, would expect on the log domain, you would expect to have a parabola. But what you would ex uh, observe is that these more of the Laplacian tails and it turns out that one can model the, this non-Gaussian signal as a modulated Gaussian, meaning that the variance of um, the signal at each moment in time can be Gaussian, but the variance changes as a function of time. In other words, that we have... Um, A modulated, uh, a modulated Gaussian, and the sum of Gaussians with different variants is no longer a Gaussian, and so it can give rise to this uh, sparse distribution. I, I feel like I should ask for some questions here. So um, to provide more context is, um, so for example, when you he a person is speaking, you have bouts of high volume and then silence. So the variance is modulated in time. And same thing with uh, light intensity images where locally if you look at um, natural world the variance when you look at the sky is smaller than the when you look at the ground so the overall light intensity distribution will have this uh, non-gaussian shape but one can obtain this um, function 
as a combination of Gaussian with different variants. Oh. So um, that's this procedure here where you take um, the underlying signal and um, and extract the variance here and multiply the variance of the signal times the Gaussian noise. And as a result, you would get a distribution of signals that is non-Gaussian as a modulation of an um, underlying white noise times the variance that is time dependent. And um, so that's an example from the natural images here, same uh, type of the distribution. And um, um, so we talked about this. And then I wanted to um, show an example uh, from my own work on um, with predictions that are similar to optimal filtering, but also signatures of this non-Gaussian effects. So let's see. <clears throat> so as we discussed today, so in this case, these are natural images that were presented to an animal and they um, this is filtering in both spatial domain in the top uh, part and in uh, uh, high frequencies in the bottom part. So if we focus on the top part here, uh, what is shown here is um, the, how neurons filter both natural scenes and white noise. The power spectrum of natural scenes and white noise is shown here. So for natural scenes, it's 1 over f, as we discussed. And for white noise, it's a constant. So in this analysis, you would like to check whether neurons can adapt to changes in the input distribution with um, um, according to the prescriptions of the information theory. So these are the observed filters under these conditions. One is in the white noise condition, the other one is in the um, natural scenes. And um, um, the product, if you take, so according to the decorrelation prescription, the product of the power spectrum of natural scenes um, of neural filters times the signals should be a constant. So within the range within these filters are changing, one can see that they overlap within um, certain a range of frequencies. And the, um, the overlap is the same um, to the same function. And whether we are talking about natural scenes, which is in blue and white noise is in red. But what is interesting and somewhat is unexplained, and I would say this is a consequence of having a nonlinear model and also non-Gaussian signals, is that the decorrelation would predict that after filtering, we will have a constant power spectrum. But what we see is that there are remaining correlations and Yes, the signal for the white noise, when the signal is white noise here in red, that the neurons actually correlate the white noise signals in order, in order to bring it to the same level as um, uh, in the case of the natural scenes. Um, I, um, so which part is not clear? Okay. <clears throat> so 
So any questions from the previous parts of the derivation? Switch Not on. just about So Tanya, time. sorry, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah, okay, so uh, maybe you can explain what is the relation between uh, LK and PK and uh, S omega and N omega in the, in the previous slides. So P of K is uh, the signal. So this will be S of omega. Okay. And L of K will be G of K. Ah, okay. So the... Um, Okay. Uh, I I mean I I have more maybe a PowerPoint, but um, I was reluctant. I cannot quite comment in the PowerPoint. So, um, yeah. So I I apologize if this was. So essentially, the prediction should be that uh, L K times P of K should be a constant. Yeah. So that's the prediction of the linear model. And. Uh, there are two deviations. One is that, um, first of all, so the neural responses, you know, there are two um, kind of many things to, to talk about this data. So what is shown here is the tuning of neurons. And it's similar, so the, if, you, if you focus just on the blue curve, it is similar to what we've seen in the retina. And um, basically, they do bandpass filtering. Mm -hmm. Now, the question is to what extent they can be modified when you drastically change the statistics of input signals. So in this case, we change from correlated, from natural scenes, which are strongly correlated, to white noise, which do not have the same structure. So it appears that um, the signal is optimized for natural scenes. And when you present white noise, it can change, but only at low spatial frequencies. At high spatial frequencies, it cannot change in real time. The explanation for this is that the system is set up to process natural scenes, but there are some inputs that are malleable, and they're mostly um, are coming from coordination between other neurons. So it is on a broader scale, maybe contextual modulation signals from other parts of the brain. And this part can modify the low frequency, the effective low frequency of the neuron. But the, the rest of the system is um, fixed and is not adaptable on mm -hmm. re relatively short time scales that were here, about 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. So the part that is adaptable, um, when we change between natural scenes and white noise, then, um, so the power spectrum of the input changed, so it converts what it should have, um, to its target. So if you assume that this is the optimal solution under natural scenes, then in the region where it is changing, the change with white noise is the same as, um, in, as in the case of uh, um, the target function with natural scenes. Another question is, why is this curve not a, a straight line? So the standard prediction that we discussed so far for decorrelation, that at least up until the signal drops off, it should be a constant. But what is observed here in experiments is that it is a, some function that is not a constant. The first explanation that can be given is that you have um, on the previous um, lectures, we discussed that neurons are nonlinear. So you have nonlinearity applied to the uh, linear output. And so instead of saying that I need a constant, 
I will mm -hmm. say, uh, we say that there is some other function which we don't know, but to the extent to which the input, and if it is optimal, then when the input signal is changing, then it should maintain this um, function. So mm -hmm. the explanation is that in a nonlinear system, you no longer expect a constant, but there is a, some other unknown function that I don't think hasn't been derived so far. And uh, the observation is that in the region where the nervous system can adapt, it uh, maintains the same function um, um, under changes in the input distribution. Mm -hmm. Another point, another way of interpreting this is um, um, I was planning to talk about in the course about error correction. I'm not sure whether that will, you know, we will have time for extensive error correction discussion, but this is an illustration of an error correction, <clears throat> meaning it decorrelates, but it doesn't decorrelate fully. So if you compare the power spectrum of natural scenes, and after filtering, yes, it downgrades these frequencies, but it leaves some residual correlations in the signal. And so um, it's partial decorrelation. You decorrelate, but you also leave some uh, correlations that can be used to correct for errors um, nevertheless. So that's another explanation. Any, um, then the bottom part um, is the same analysis, the same data, actually, but analyzing signals not at the zero frequency, which is showing here zero temporal frequency, but at higher temporal frequencies. And um, in the case of natural scenes, the power spectrum is 1 over f, um, at higher temporal frequencies as it is at lower temporal frequencies, but because it's 1 over f and 1 over omega, then the power frequency of natural scenes at high temporal frequencies is actually below the power, um, the power of the white noise at higher temporal frequencies. So in this case, the uh, because the natural scenes have less power, so in the top part, the natural scenes have more power than the white noise, so the sensitivity was less. Here, um, the sensitivity is greater for natural scenes. So in other words, the signal um, integrates um, signals across uh, space in order to get a higher signal at um, higher temporal frequencies and the product stays the same within the range of frequencies that the receptive fields are modifiable. Okay, so I think I, um, that's um, most of the um, words I was going to say with this slide. Um, any uh, questions about the lecture today? Um, so we discussed um, the information and um, water filling solution. Um, and here are some examples of decorrelation. Uh, this is in the primary visual cortex, but you can see that the decorrelation happens at all stages of visual processing. Yeah. So any question? So um, I will begin the next talk by the kind of a psychophysical adaptation, and um, um, there are some uh, examples of um, uh, adaptation how um, to various parameters, not just to low frequencies, but also to uh, color. So it, it's known that people adapt to changes in color during summer versus um, winter, and, and so on. Mm -hmm. And also adapt uh, as a function of age.
to the same color as the lens changes, you compensate the changes in the lens quality and so on. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I don't see questions. So, okay, so should we resume uh, uh, on Friday? Friday, same time? So should we stop?